Oh, well, hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience and for joining us here today. Um, I'm Kara from Dark Horse, and we are joined today by some of the creators who work with Mike Mignola in the Greater Mignola Universe Says. Um, we're going to talk about those universes in more depth momentarily. First, I would like to introduce Christopher Golden. Would you like to say a brief hello, Chris? Yeah. Hi, Kara. Hi. And hi, everyone tuning in. I'm sorry we're out of time. We've got to go. No, I'm <laughs> um, sorry for the delay. It's uh, technology in the age of Corona. Very true. Yes, we're all coming to you live from our offices, living rooms, etc. at home. And I'm sure you are all watching from home as well. So thank you. And we are excited to bring you uh, what content we can, although conventions and such are on hold for the moment. Um, we are waiting on Warwick. He will hopefully be joining us soon. In the meantime, we have my cat Rex. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce Ben Stenbeck, who is an artist who works on so many different Mignola titles. Ooh. Hello, Ben. <laughs> it's kind of his art screen for now. Um, so yeah, when, when Warwick is able to join us, we will add him in also. Uh, and we'll be chatting today about working in the worlds that Mike Mignola has created or co-created and some of the characters that he has helped create. Uh, while we chat, Ben has kindly agreed to occupy our eyeballs and his own hands by showing off some sketching in his own style. Um, when Warwick joins us, he will hopefully be doing the same. Um, I would also, before we get started, like to shout out the editor of the Mignolaverse, uh, Katie O'Brien. She unfortunately is not able to join us here today, but she's probably watching at home. And also David Hyde, who helped bring us all together today. Um, he is the one who places all of that great Mignola content for you online with outlets and things like this very stream here today. Um, although we have announced many exciting new series planned for later this year in the Mignolaverse, um, single issues and some books are of course currently on hiatus due to the pandemic. Um, so our team is working hard on getting these rescheduled with printers, distributors, and retailers. And so we'll announce new release dates for those as soon as we can. Um, just a heads up before we get into any of those. Um, a quick rundown for those of you in the chat. Uh, we'll be doing a giveaway today. You can enter this giveaway by putting the keyword into the chat once and only once, please. Um, use the hashtag or pound sign, and the keyword is vampires vampires that's plural and uh that's for obvious reasons because we see a lot of vampires in all of the series we're going to talk about today um what you will win if you are chosen and drawn from the chat is a copy of baltimore omnibus volume one and a copy of our encounters with evil uh the chat is also open for your own questions so please start uh putting those into the chat our moderators will go through those and We'll include those for Christopher and for Ben today, and hopefully Warwick when he joins us. Um, you're welcome to ask them any questions you have about the Mignolaverse and the titles we're talking about today. Oh, and I look, see Warwick. We have we lost Ben somehow, but Warwick is here. <laughs> I, I did him in, so as I can get involved. So welcome, Warwick. Howdy. How are you doing? Uh, good so far. My my cat is also here. He has insisted on joining us. So Rex, meet Warwick. <laughs> How do you, Rex? Well, um, I didn't mention yesterday we got uh, no cats but three dogs, and we got some pigeons and bits and pieces in the garden. So this time of year, they're just any minute they're just going to come racing through and barking loudly. So I yeah. I encourage this. Um, <laughs> I I really do. I like when pets actually enter the streams. Um, Rex is purring directly into the microphone, so I apologize if that's loud. Um, maybe you can move, Rex. No, he won't. Well, anyway, so yes, as I was saying, if you want to ask any questions about the Mignola verse in the chat, we will get to those in a little bit. Um, please put those where our mods can see them. And one final note before we move on into it. Um, all the books we're going to discuss today are currently available from comic shops, bookstores, and anywhere you would normally buy books, as well as digitally on Dark Horse Digital and Comixology, other digital services like that. 
Um, to help you stay occupied at home right now with some great reading material, everything is 50% off at Dark Horse Digital. Uh, this has now been extended throughout the entire month of May since we are all still essentially quarantining. Uh, we've also offered free issue number one so you can try out the series that we're going to talk about today. Baltimore, Witchfinder, um, Our Encounters with Evil is a graphic novel, so that one we may be able to offer at one free chapter, but not the full book. Um, but those are all available again, digital.darkhorse.com, and those links are going to be in the chat as well. We also would like to encourage you to shop locally if you can. Many comic shops and bookstores are offering online ordering, um, also doing pickup, delivery, things like that. Um, I recommend checking comicshoplocator.com and indiebound.org to help find shops near you. Um, our books are still available through Penguin Random House, so they are, in fact, something you can get from your bookstores. Um, Chris and Warwick, would you like to recommend any of your local shops that are open and doing deliveries? Go ahead, Warwick. Uh, well, um, one which is nowhere near local, which is where I get most of my comics from, from whatever. Leeds, which is obviously, um, and uh, that's, and then um, much more local, CGC Emporium in Chichester, which is comics, games and coffee. And they also running mail order stuff at the moment as well. Okay. Um, I would recommend, I, I'm not sure what the status is right now, but local to me, my local comic shop is the Comic Book Palace in Haverhill, Massachusetts. They have their own uh, YouTube show, show uh, that's been ongoing for years. Um, and uh, one I know is doing curbside pickup is uh, uh, my friend Ralph DiBernardo owns Jetpack Comics in Rochester, New Hampshire. Um, and... Uh, and then bookstore-wise, Copper Dog Books in Danvers, Massachusetts, they're doing mail order. If you can phone in orders, they ship to you directly. And, and, and again, I'd reiterate what you said, Kara. You know, I mean, obviously, the easiest thing in the world is to get uh, books from Amazon, and we rely on the sales through Amazon. But um, even so, uh, I'm always emphatic about trying to convince people to support their local independent shops, bookshops, comic shops, as much as possible. Yes, absolutely, especially during these interesting pandemic times. Oh, looks like we have Ben coming back online. Well, um, without further ado, we can get into the Q&A as well. And then um, as you are able to and comfortable, uh, Ben and Warwick, Warwick, we're going to do some sketching for us um, while we chat. We thought we might start with uh, vampires since that's a recurring theme in all of these, if you don't mind sketching some vampires in your own style. I'm gonna move Rex, cause he is in the way. Ugh, he'll probably be back. And so to begin, can you all give the fans at home a brief overview of which titles you worked on with Mike Mignola so far? And I thought we would start with Chris. Um. I've actually been working with Mike since nearly the beginning of Hellboy. Um, I interviewed him uh, for a magazine called Flux uh, shortly after the first Hellboy miniseries or while the first miniseries was coming out. Um, and the short version is that led to me doing the first Hellboy novel, which was Hellboy the Lost Army. Um, and then since then, I've written two other Hellboy novels. I've edited six or seven other Hellboy novels that other people have written. I've edited four Hellboy anthologies. Uh, Tom Snagoski and I wrote the first BPRD miniseries, Hollow Earth, so the first spin-off from Hellboy. Um, and then Mike and I created, uh, well, we did the novels that from which we spun off Baltimore uh, and Joe Golem, Occult Detective. And how about you, Warwick? Uh, much, much less than that. Um, uh, just uh, the, the two books, um, Mr. Higgins Comes Home, and then um, last year, Our Encounters with Evil, um, which were sort of separate wholly from, from the, I mean, not uh, the Minola universe, possibly not even the outer verse, but e even further than that. But uh, I don't know. I don't know how that works. <laughs> The outer outer verse. We'll come up with another name for the it. Work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. The that way. 
<laughs> well, of course, no, yeah, I, I'll endorse that, definitely. <laughs> well, and Chris, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what the outer verse means. Um, so, <clears throat> I guess the short version is that um, while we were working on the Baltimore comic and planning to do Joe Golem comics, <laughs> even then I kind of knew that the two were connected, particularly because we knew that that Baltimore would end with, um, well, we, we don't want no spoilers. We knew that Baltimore would have a cataclysmic event at the end of it. Uh, and and timing wise, it seemed like we could easily make it match the date of the cataclysmic event that we know sets the world on a different path in Joe Golem, which happened in 1925. Um, and so we started to thread little hints through the Joe Golem comic book that the two were connected. Um, and then as we were working on wrapping up Joe Golem and, and wrapping up Baltimore, already sort of we started to have these ideas about expanding that universe, but doing it in such a way, so many people still don't realize that they're the same universe because Baltimore ends in 1925. And uh, the Joe Golem story, comic that people are familiar with starts about 30 years later and goes until the mid 70s um so we wanted to do a sort of uh a story that takes place somewhere in the middle which in this case is 1938 that really brings all the threads together so that people really understand that this is one world with its own unique alternate history um and uh, a wide variety of characters that are all connected the Joe Golem books are full of interesting little hints um, to all kinds of things. So if you haven't read those yet, if you're watching at home, um, check out the Joe Golem books. Uh, there are several mini series. So um, those are available on Dark Horse Digital as well as in collections at comic shops and bookstores. Uh, welcome back, Ben. Hello. <laughs> Maybe we'll go back and uh, can you tell us a little bit about which books you have worked on with Mike Mignola so far? Okay, I started out on Witchfinder. No, I started out on, I did a one issue origin story for Johann Krauss with John Arcudi. Um, and then I drew the first Witchfinder book. And then I moved on to the Outerverse and drew the first four and a half volumes of Baltimore. And then, what did I do then? Then Frankenstein Underground. Um, and then a couple of Hellboy books, Hellboy things, not Hellboy books, but a couple of Hellboy stories. And Koshche or Koske, however you say it, <laughs> and um, and another Witchfinder book in there somewhere. I think just, that's it. Just a few, just a few yeah, titles yeah. with Mike. <laughs> and and a few other things sprinkled through. I did one one issue of Lobster Johnson and various various things. I did a Hellboy story for Playboy magazine. All right. All sorts. Frequent Mignola collaborator, Ben Stanback. Yeah, and then we <laughs> then we dragged him back to Baltimore for our eight-issue Baltimore versus not King Kong. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and that is a new bonus story included in the Baltimore Omnibus Volume 2. Would you like to talk a little bit more? Hey, there it is. <laughs> Such a beautiful book. It is gorgeous. Uh, how did that story come to be, if you don't mind telling us about that, Chris? Uh, you can blame Facebook. Um, ben can chime in on this too. You know, Mike had done uh, the Year of Monsters, uh, where that year every 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 month one of the Mignola verse or Outerverse titles would have an alternate cover that Mike did that featured a classic monster, his take on a vampire, a where a Dracula, a wolf man, some kind of Black Lagoon like creature. And one month he did Baltimore fighting, not King Kong. Um, and he reposted it on Facebook, met, you know, much later. 
um, a couple of years ago, whenever it was, he reposted that image and Ben and I were responding to the post about, um, oh, geez, I wish we had done that story rather than just, you know, and Ben immediately was like, I'm in. And I was like, me too. And so, and unless Mike has an objection and Mike's like, no, we should absolutely do it. But then we were just looking for an opportunity to, to make it come to life. And, um, I don't remember who suggested it as a, um, you know, as a little freebie to go inside the Baltimore Omnibus Volume 2, but um, I'm so glad we did it because uh, it was ridiculously fun. <laughs> Baltimore stories are not known as being very lighthearted stories. <laughs> um, it can be it can be pretty dour, pretty grim, and uh, but this was the one. There you go, right there. Um, <laughs> This was uh, this was as lighthearted as Baltimore gets, um, and also <laughs> I think kind of turned out weirdly sweet, uh, which is not a, a word you'll ever hear me use about the character again. But <laughs> um, yeah, King, King Kong esque lookalikes bring out the sweetness in Baltimore. Yes, well, definitely. Pick up Baltimore Omnibus Volume 2 to get that bonus story. It is worth it. Do you... Here's a fun question, actually, for all of you. Maybe we'll start with with you, Chris. Do you have any favorite monsters that you might like to see enter the Mignolaverse at some point? Or Outerverse? Um, I mean, just all of them. You know, one of the things that I like to do the most, and I'm really more curious about what the other guys will say, uh, one of the things I like to do the most is sort of... Uh, sort of dredge through uh, old folklore, particularly from around the world in different places. Um, I think that's why Mike and I have worked together well for so long, because I like the sort of esoteric stuff. Um, so even like going through Baltimore, you'll find, you know, uh, these demons whose legs are 10 feet long and they, dang the, they dangle their legs from trees and their feet are really sharp. And you can like, you know, it, it's just really weird stuff that... Um, and that stuff I really like to pull in because it's so odd. Um, as far as classic monsters, you know, I feel like you can't really do... I wouldn't want to do like a Creature from the Black Lagoon story in the Mignolaverse because of Abe. I feel like any story that you'd do there would have to be an Abe story. Um, but I'd love to see a, you know, uh, some kind of Outerverse story with, you know, Baltimore or somebody in the jungles of, you know, South America encountering a, a gill man, you know, but anyway. <laughs> uh, how about you, Warwick? Are there any monsters you'd especially like to see, maybe that you would like to draw? In the Warwick-verse or, or elsewhere? Anyone. It would, I, I think it'd have to be all of them. Um, they're just... Um, and this is, this is going to get sort of repetitive, but... Um, yeah, just like to have a go. I mean, variety, being able to sort of change around and do all sorts. So, you know, uh, fish men, sea monsters, and but then take it somewhere else and haunted houses. You know, it's just being able to muck around with all of them. So um, rather than pick one, I sort of rather just take it in turns and, and, and have a go at all of them, one after the other. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, Creature from the Back Lagoon is, a, is quite a favourite. But then also the there's so many varieties so you could do a wolfman but you could do a you know it's which sort of wolfman is it <laughs> sort of the guy in the shirt who's got a funny just you know it's just like a head, guy with a head full of hair or is it actually like a wolf on its own or is it something you know and what stretches in between so you know you could there's a lot of variety even in one genre of monster one group of monster you know you could whether you're dracula's a a bat or a, a man or a in between or a, or a woman or a you know I don't think well you know dog or a somebody else you know it, it, it's just that sort of variety so yeah, all of them that is the quick answer fair enough fair enough uh, Ben how about yourself any monsters that you haven't gotten to draw yet that you might like to in the Mignolaverse Outerverse no I'm I'm kind of happy with any monsters really i do like doing the weird stuff like in uh Koshche when we did the nightingale such a, a silly odd thing 
to to play around with, and I like getting a chance to do those sorts of creatures. Um, yeah, but I'm happy. I'm happy with the variety. Just getting a chance to do all of them. Um, we got to do a um, werewolf story that I really like with Baltimore, um, and I've always wanted. I'd always wanted to do like a good, nice werewolf story, and kind of feel like. It, for me, we kind of covered that with with the Baltimore story we did. So getting a chance to do things like that, do a you know, I've I've probably done zombies enough, um, and maybe we even vampires. Did, did giant crabs just for yeah. you? <laughs> and giant crabs. <laughs> yeah. I do love the Nightingale. Uh, Kashe the Deathless is one of my personal favorite recent stories and the nightingale is a large part of that so thank you for right. contributions <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh, ben and warwick if you would like we can turn the cameras to your art too sure. um, i mean i, I like speaking to it. your faces but um i don't want you to be drawing in vain um so yeah we were having these two start with some vampires but i think it, by the sounds of it we'll get into some other fun monsters as we go along um, we do have a question from chat, which I'll bring over. Um, ben, is there a chance that we'll see you drawing Sir Edward again? Now, without spoilers, perhaps, do you have any thoughts on drawing some more Sir Edward Grey Witchfinder? Um, there's, there's been talk about different things. Um... So it's been ideas tossed about. I'm hold on a sec. So I'm not really sure what things are still, um, and even without you know coronavirus stuff involved, I'm not sure what discussions are still, still, still ooh, things that might happen or might not happen. Yes, we are still working on scheduling and rescheduling for sure. Scheduling and rescheduling. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Scheduling and rescheduling. A little echo. Um, from, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to get uh, um, get the camera on for the drawing, but um, it wasn't moving but, um, as smoothly as yesterday. I'll carry on. <laughs> in, possibly in some format, somehow, sometime. <laughs> so a return... Perhaps in the future, we will definitely announce when we are able to. Um, as I mentioned before, there are also some questions I see in the chat about um, Lady Baltimore, which I know Chris and I are both very excited about. Um, yes, as soon as we can reschedule that, we will absolutely announce new release dates for it. Um, but as with most single issue series right now, it is on hiatus for the moment. Um, comics printers distributors and retailers, of course, are all still affected by the pandemic, but we are working hard to get everything back on track as soon as possible. Rex really wants to be on this show today, so <laughs> here he is again. Let him join us. <laughs> I'm fine with him as long as he doesn't, you know, completely get in my way. Uh, maybe eventually, maybe this is his message that he would like to be drawn into a Hellboy comic at some point. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, we'll have to ask Mike about this, Rex. So, I do have another question for all of you. Um, and maybe we can begin with Chris again, since I know that Warwick and Ben are kind of setting up to draw. Uh, how familiar were you with Mike's stories or characters before you joined him to work on a project? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's actually really easy for me, which is that um, it was right at the beginning. I, I had... Uh, I'd reviewed Hellboy and uh, been assigned to I interview him um, a million years ago when when he was just starting with with Hellboy. Um, prior to that, of course, I knew him only from things like Cosmic Odyssey. Um, so uh, immediately, I was just taken by it because I love the that kind of atmosphere, you know. And I I think I said to him, you know, you should. In the 70s, Marvel used to do these prose backups in their prose black and white horror magazine. Uh, it's me again, sorry. That's no, okay. <laughs> A little echo as we set up. Um, 
So the uh, and I said to Mike, you know, you should serialize, uh, you know, a Hellboy prose story in the back of the second Hellboy miniseries. And he said, oh, and I suppose you'd want to write it. And mm -hmm. I'd written, I'd, I think I'd written my first novel, or maybe it hadn't come out, but I'd written it already. And I said, well, it wouldn't have to be me, but I certainly wouldn't say no. And um, so he read the book and then he got back to me and he said, well, I don't want to do it as a backup, but um, if you want to do it as a standalone novel, I definitely would go for that. So that's what happened. That's how we started. Mm -hmm. So I was definitely familiar with his work, but it was very early on. Sure, sure. Uh, how about you, Ben? Were you a reader of Mignola's works before you began working with him? Yeah, yeah. I um, sort of followed him from, uh, I think, around around about the time he, he was doing the uh, Dracula adaptation. Mm. I, um, and I'd always seen his covers and, you know, and got, walking into a comic shop, it was always his covers that jumped out for me um uh so yeah so so i was i was one of those people waiting for the first issue of hellboy to come out um yeah so i've sort of always been a fan and you work i don't want to interrupt you while you're trying to get set up there oh i hate <laughs> well I ask uh, you, oh go ahead Oh, it's, yeah, no, it's all right. Um, I have an idea I might just go down to one camera, which is probably just as well. But, okay. um, but yeah, it's still the same as Ben. And, and to answer the question, I'm really hanging on for, for Hellboy to come out because um, I just, uh, with things like the, the Dracula adaptation and, and just watching his, his sort of style come from a lot of the covers, X Factor covers, sort of uh, back in the day and, um, and the jungle saga and stuff like that I was just so in love with his his style the way his style was changing and so so by the time Hellboy came out I was I was very keen looking forward to it and how did the two of you end up um, deciding to work together and come up with uh, Mr. Higgins Comes Home oh um we were on a, um, a, a comics panel in, at uh, Thought Bubble Festival in Leeds together. There were four four other artists, and we were we were just working together. And so that's the first time I, I got to sort of to say hello and to meet him. And um, and uh, after we did it, I sort of ran around to get some books signed I'd brought along, and um, and I gave him some of my sort of drawing sketchbook things. And and he he said there and then that um, you know, we should do a book together and I just thought that was the most amazing thing in the world and I went off quite happy and thinking of course nothing will ever come of it at all and um, it, it, it just he got back in touch shortly after um, I was waiting at a dentist and I got a message from him because of a, a vampire picture I posted and uh, it just yeah it, it, every now and then as we got toward Mr. Higgins coming out, you know, I kept thinking the reality check, there's, you know, this will come down, the thing or project will stop and, and that'll be the end of it. But all the while thinking, well, I'm happy with that because this is the most, you know, at that stage was the most amazing thing. And so even when I got the box of proofs uh, arrived at the door, I still wasn't 100% sure it was going to actually happen. So uh, <laughs> it, it was just sort of uh, crazy. So. <laughs> well, that would certainly improve a visit to the dentist, I think, getting good news like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And right. I'm going to, um, I just said with the camera, I'm going to maybe try and get off one and onto the other. Cause as I say, I just keep the, 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 the sound isn't, is causing some trouble. So no problem. Well, I'll, I'll have another question for everyone, and maybe we can start with Chris again. Um, what is your process like working with Mike? Does he send you a lot of notes? You go back and forth quite a bit? Um, it depends on the project. Um, you know, over the years, we've worked on things where he's been, uh, you know, for instance, well, I'll just talk about the, the, the Baltimore comic series at this point. You know, initially, because we had some specific ideas the Baltimore comics initially uh, filled in spaces that were missing in the story and the novel. They were sort of missing years, lost years, I guess. Um, 
And so Mike was very particular about what stories were going to be told um, in that space. And of course, I filled in a bunch, um, but we plotted out most of that entire first omnibus in one phone call, just sort of knowing which stories we wanted to cover. Um, and then on the the um, the remainder, it was much more uh, of stories that I had ideas about what I wanted to do. He had some ideas about what he wanted to do. Um, and it often it comes down to whether Mike is going to tell me no or not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I tease him a lot, you know, uh, there are there are certain words that, um, you know, phrases that he doesn't want characters to say um, because he doesn't like them, you know. Um, so it's always been, you know, it's always been really interesting, but it depends on the project, you know. On the, the Baltimore novel, uh, he had about 85% of the thing plotted out. And, um, and then uh, I filled in the space that was missing in the plot. And um, I, of course, I wrote the prose, and, and but I would send him, you know, a few thousand words at a time, and he would uh, come back to me with really specific notes about um, what he was looking for, and that was great because I wanted to make sure that I was giving him, uh, that, he, that I was giving him what he was seeing in his head as much as possible. And how about you, Ben? Uh, working with Mike, what what is your process usually like? Does he send you a lot of notes? Um, can you tell us a bit about that. It's it's always different, um, especially uh, the biggest difference is between if I'm working with Mike directly or um, working on a Mignola book with another writer. Um, if I'm working directly with Mike. It's usually just the script and maybe maybe one one or two maybe he'll do one or two layout um, thumbnails per issue for so something sometimes it's easier for him to just do a quick little picture um, than explain what he's after mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I think that's kind of it. Some, sometimes he'll get involved. Sometimes I have to try and talk him into doing a creature design. <laughs> um, yeah, I know there's an extensive sketchbook in, in Kashe, for example. Uh, speaking of my favorite, Nightingale. Was that one you had to convince Mike of? No, that was... I did all those sketches and um, and I came up with that design... And I thought, no one's going to go for that. That's, that's too stupid. Uh, but he liked it. And then he drew it on the cover. And of course, of course, whenever he draws a, whenever he takes something that I've designed and draws it, he suddenly elevates it so much more. And you go, oh, that's why that's a cool idea. <laughs> Well, I love I love his cover with the nightingale, but I also love the nightingale yeah. throughout the interiors. So, one of the everybody. things you know when you're scripting, um, occasionally I'll get to a point in a script where I've suggested a monster, um, and sometimes I'll put into the script, you know, hey, you know, hey Mike, do you want to design this? Um, and occasionally he, you know, because I'm just like uh, he, he's very particular, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And uh, and so sometimes you know you wanna you wanna push it on that. Um, for instance, there's a there's a monster in an upcoming Outerverse story that um, I knew that we weren't going to get away with unless he did the design first. Um, and so you know occasionally we'll we'll do that, but yeah. <laughs> and Warwick, you have kind of a unique to this group anyway set up with Mike. Um, so Mr. Higgins comes home. Um, how did how did your process working with Mike differ between that first volume and then Our Encounters with Evil? Because you took on more of the writing duties with Our Encounters. Is that correct? I'm not sure how well he can hear me right now. <laughs> well, if he is muted, that's all right. We can move on to the next until he is back. Uh, ben, do you mind telling uh, us a little bit? Oh, that oh, go ahead. There you go. Uh, so I, I, I muted it 
to help <laughs> avoid the issues with the um, with the feedback, and yeah, no uh, which didn't seem to make any difference this time. So, mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, yeah um, sorry, yeah, because I was just replying to your uh, question and not realising I was uh, my uh, was off. No problem. Um, big difference. Yes, it was. Um, uh, um, Mr. Higgins, I was sort of getting uh, pages of script and. Yeah, just well, working from that, whereas um, whereas I was sort of providing that the second time round, sort of sending it to um, to Mike and um, and those bits and pieces. So it was much more uh, over to me than the first time. Um, but it was great working with the on Mr. Higgins with the Mike script, just the way he sort of does it. It was quite quite loose and it's sort of uh, bullet pointed, but it was really nice and uh, nice. In the process, just because the, the script stuff wasn't sort of finalised until later on, I had pages laid out and and uh, roughs done, and, and then the general script was there. But then there'd be just bits. So all the process, you know, there'd be new bits of the story or bits of his sort of touch, which would sort of be added to it as it went along, which was fantastic to be uh, to be able to watch as we did, as I did. Mm -hmm. so. And for those watching at home, if you have not picked these books up, they are excellent. There are two volumes out now. Mr. Higgins Comes Home is the first one, and Our Encounters with Evil is the second. And that's kind of a shorter version of a much longer title that uh, it's just it's <laughs> unfortunately too long, too long to put in print on everything all the time. <laughs> yes, dead right. <laughs> And uh, Ben and Warwick, do you mind, since we can see both of your drawing surfaces now, can you tell us a little bit about the tools you're using today? Um, and why don't we start with Warwick? Um, this this it, mechanical pencil, it's I, um, and it's a cheap one. It's a Zebra Graphics, and it's just um, soft lead 2B. And I just always have preferred pencil i'm working more with uh, ink various sorts of uh, pens at the moment sort of a bit of a collection which will probably pile out in a minute but um but these are the pencils they're um i just got piles of them but they're all the same sort of thing and it's just um the mechanical end is different i love a, a regular pencil but you can get a good sort of fat line with one of these and then just with a turn you you, you know i don't know how well that shows up but by sort of changing you get a good squash and then or a much lighter touch and so you can vary your line weight quite a lot so and then i've got lots of sort of i'll just grab my over see but um various different so this is the, um just the i like box so I, i'll have more uh and put another page on top when i come to ink so i don't mind scruffing this all over but these are some um tombow pens and so just a variety of these sorts of soft food pens i think they are fud so but uh, pencils, my my pencils, my big favorite. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I know for the artists watching at home, it's always good to get an idea of the tools you're using and and the process. Um, how about you, Ben? What are you using today? Um, I'm just using, uh, I don't know. It's just a <laughs> clutch pencil. I usually that one's got quite a thick. Where can you see that? Yes. Wow, yeah. Quite a thick, um, but I usually just use that one. Um, and these are just brush tip pens. Just buy them cheap off eBay, and you can get a lot of variation in in the tip, and also microns. The classic. Um, Are these? Yeah, the same? No, nothing, nothing really fancy. Just kind of cheap stuff. That's fair enough. You know, if it gets the job done. Are these yeah. the same tools you would use? And you've got uh, to kind of burn through them. You know, like I, I try to use a fresh pen um, for every page, so it starts to get expensive after a while if you, um, you know, with yeah. other pens. Fair enough. So these are the tools you would use for for inking a an actual comics page, then too. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, there you have it. So if you have any other art process questions, feel free to drop those in the chat if you're watching at home. Um, I have another question for Chris. Um, how do you approach world or universe building, especially in the case of the shared universe of uh, Baltimore and Joe Gollum, since they exist but weren't explicitly linked? Yeah, I mean, what was really interesting is um, how naturally they came together. And, um, and it really is just about finding the, the places where they do overlap so that uh, you can just make sense of it. You know, I mean, this is, um, I'm a novelist first, and this is a terrible answer, but I'm a novelist first, and um, when an editor comes back to me with a question that is um, saying, this is missing from the story, you didn't address this, so this is an issue that the reader might bump on, um, you need to cover it so that that doesn't happen. A lot of times what I'll do is, uh, rather than go off on a tangent, I'll just have a character ask the question that the editor asked me and another character answer that question. And it's sort of the same process that I do with myself when I'm trying to do world building. You know, I, I, I come up with, you know, that question that is uh, like, how does the Red King in Baltimore connect with the outer dark in Joe Golem. And it's the answer to that question. It's like you're demanding an answer. You've got to come up with a way to put those two things together. And fortunately, in this case, it was really organic. It was really organic the way that they fit together. You know, the, the stuff in the uh, Joe Golem story, The Drowning City, is so um, Lovecraftian. But what we've done in other places in the outer verse is not. Um, and so we found this interesting middle ground and we're just building from there. Um, it's also about necessity, you know, the um, necessity is the mother of invention. So um, there are characters that I wanted to have in the new outer verse stories and figuring out a way to make that happen to explain their presence causes the creation of more world building. And then the last thing I'll say is also it comes with the artist you're working with. Um, you know, with uh, Ben wanting to do giant crabs uh, led to the creation of Dr. Lescavar's remedy. And Dr. Lescavar occurs again in the not King Kong story that we have in the Baltimore Omnibus Volume 2. Um, and then working with, uh, with Bridget Connell on um, Lady Baltimore has been fantastic because one of the first things Bridget did, because her brain... She needs to understand everything. And so one of the first things she did is say, explain to me about your witches in this universe. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take the witches in Baltimore and the witches in Joe Golem and sort of create a hierarchy. And Bridget actually was a massive part of that, creating different types of witches and, and different types of covens. And I had to take what she'd done um, and fit it into my vision for what this thing should be. Um, so it's been such a great process, but it really is about thinking about it all, um, trying to explain how World War II happens in the outer verse in Lady Baltimore, even though we killed Hitler in Baltimore, the curse bells. Um, but I mean, that's but fine. World War II still happens, you know, um, even without him. So, yeah, that's that segues into another interesting question, I think. Um, so for the alternate history, how how did you approach this? And how how does supernatural elements factor in? Um, you know, it's it really is just about, um, you know, dropping a rock in the in the stream. You know, where does the water go? And I, this is terrible. But you know, where does the water go when you drop the rock in the stream? It's going to find its way. Mm -hmm. So I always look at it as like, let me take this supernatural thing, plant it in the real history. Um, uh, I'm, I was a double major in history and English in college, so I'm a, I'm a love history. And so um, to take the real history, plant this thing in it and see what tangent that forces history to take. You know, for instance, if you didn't have Adolf Hitler, then how does World War II begin? if you need World War II to happen anyway. Um, and it's just, it's really fun. I mean, you know, 
with World War I and the original Baltimore stories, you know, there was the, the plague of 1918. Um, there was, uh, or the, the pandemic uh, in 1918. Uh, and it did impact the progress of the war. Um, so it's really interesting just to play with all of those things, you know, who would have been where, you know, who would Baltimore's allies have been, uh, where would they have fought in the war, you know? Um, so it's just, it's, it's always that question of taking reality and just, you know, dropping your weirdness into the bucket of reality. <laughs> yeah. And so you also have included a few historical characters as well. Um, do you get to kind of pick and choose ones that you make up to fit in with the alternate universe then and work in some of these uh, actual historical characters? And, and I guess what informs your choice of those historical figures? Um, you know, it's really about what we, um, you know, what we need and what we desire for the story. I, I can't honestly remember whether it was me or Mike who um, suggested Hitler in the curse bells. Um, I'd like to say it was me, but I honestly don't remember. Uh, but when we're doing that, it's about then finding out as much information as you can about Hitler's real, uh, youth and how old he was at the time of the story, and then figuring out how you can twist it to fit the story you want to tell. Um, and then, you know, Madame Blavatsky was definitely a mic. Mike was like, we've got to include M Madame Blavatsky, but Blavatsky <laughs> then became a much more important character. She appears sort of throughout, um, and we're not done with her yet. So that's <laughs> a whole other, that's a, that's dropping uh, a spoiler there. But, um, and then for instance, you know, on the phone one day, planning out the stories that would be the sort of one shots and two issue stories that we were going to do, um, the idea for the play was, um, well, we need to have a story with Edgar Allan Poe's head in a glass box. Um, that was literally the only reason that the story existed and that we did that comic was because we wanted to have Poe's head in a box. <laughs> um, and, you know, so it's just, it is just about kind of, but for instance, in Lady Baltimore, um, we're referring to, when we, when we are referring to the people who are leaders in France and, and Great Britain at the time, we use the real names um, mm -hmm. because there's no reason not to, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, the comics get a little more specific, I think, than the novels initially in terms of, you know, giving exact dates, for example. Right. Yeah. Um, what are some of the influences that go into this story, such as, you know, genres of books or were you influenced by any movies or music, anything like that as you were writing Baltimore, for example? Um, well, Baltimore, you know, Mike and I have talked a number of times. Baltimore is sort of, um, it, it's Stoker's Dracula and Moby Dick um, kind of jammed together. Uh, and you can add things like The Fugitive, weirdly, for me at least. <laughs> um, that was at the beginning with the novel. That was very much taking sort of Dracula and Moby Dick and kind of making them one thing. Um, but overall for me, and I know this is true for Mike as well, and I think it's most visible in the first two volumes of Baltimore, um, Hammer Films, Hammer Studios movies, huge influence on me. Um, I still, I'm rewatching them all now. Um, and and I think the Curse Bells basically is a Hammer movie, um, and even the Plague Ships is put, sort of like what's that? I put Ingrid Pitt. I put Ingrid Pitt in the Curse Bells. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I think Ben, I, I, you you may remember. I'm not sure, but I'm sure that I re I referenced Peter Cushing in various places. Mm. Um, sure, you know, he's in just, there. I can't think where. Yeah, yeah, but it's just. Um, you know, it's it's a that stuff is a big influence um, on Baltimore, but it becomes this sort of larger, uh, this larger sort of tonal question. As we go further into it, um, you do get a little bit of the Lovecraftian elements, and you get a lot of old mythology. You know, as I said, like I love 
the old folklore. And the one thing I will say, and then I'll, the other guys should talk, <laughs> is that um, my favorite thing over the years about working with Mike is that as a storyteller, particularly as a novelist, because in novels we kind of have to do this more often than not, I always feel like I have to explain things. And the way Mike's imagination works is that he's always feeling like he doesn't want to explain things. And uh, because he is Mike Vignola and he has the freedom to kind of do whatever the hell he wants, mm -hmm. you can get away with it when you're working with Mike and just saying, yeah, and then the guy's head falls on the ground and it burns up and a, and a raven flies out and flies away. Well, why does that happen? Because it does, <laughs> yeah. you know, because <laughs> because something like it might have happened in a, uh, you know, in a folklore folk tale that we read uh, and we thought it was cool, you know, or or we just put things together from other places. And that's one of the best things that he's taught me is that you don't have to always explain everything. Sometimes it's OK if it's just cool. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, some of us, myself included, need that reminder, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about uh, for you, Ben? Um, do you, Were you influenced by horror movies as well, then? Yeah, yeah, I've always been a um, big fan of horror movies. I, I sort of came from more um, 80s genre stuff. Um, but... Uh, yeah, sort of in my in my mid twenties, I started getting into all, all the older sort of Hammer and Universal horror. Um, but yeah, I've always I've always loved horror films. Mostly, I'm interested. I like cre stuff with creatures, anything with monsters. I'm not a fan of horror, but um, you know, I like torture porn horror that's just. Um, kind of masochistic for the sake of it doesn't really work for me i kind of uh, prefer the atmosphere and monsters and all of that the monsters and creatures are absolutely i think a recurring theme and the foundation for all of these mignola and outerverse titles uh warwick i feel like the influence of hammer on um your books is pretty pretty uh at the forefront, is that something that you considered? Um, are you very influenced by those or other horror films? Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, we we off uh, uh, Mike and I. That was a big, big common ground. Um, Universal movies and and Hammer horror films were definitely sort of a, a real sort of uh, point of interest and so it was easy for us to, to, to get along you know looking and discussing the ideas and stuff because it was a, sort of all coming from that same sort of well and so um you know and, and they're great in this sort of you know the the atmosphere and sort of the sort of over the overboardness the you're trying to kind of capture some of the the stuff that used to freak me out most as a kid watching those things which was that sort of the weird blood that was used and you know, it was it was obviously just sort of emulsion paint or something like that, but it, and it didn't look real, and and that almost made it sort of slightly more sort of grisly somehow. So so it was easy to sort of tap into that and 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 work from those ideas. So I think a message that is coming through a lot and clear is that for those who are at home looking for things to watch, perhaps you should check out the Hammer horror films. Um, any other horror or other uh, film recommendations that you all have right now for folks who are at quarant quarantining or staying home or otherwise might need some good horror to watch? I mean, you know, <laughs> if we, we're just going to do film recommendations. We could be here for the next seven Hours. days. Um, <laughs> here's the, the two things that I would say. Number one, I watch, I love Turner Classic movies. I watch uh, the golden age of Hollywood films a lot um and that's something that i always enjoyed them but just in the last couple of years it's become a real passion of mine um as far as horror films the last decade has been an extraordinary time for horror i mean we just have one great horror film after another one that i think is on netflix i'm pretty sure but i know it went under the radar for a lot of people 
is a low budget, creepy little film called The Autopsy of Jane Doe, um, which is really creepy, um, but wonderful. Uh, yep. Have you guys seen that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I it was. Not, but I'm making sorry. a note right now. <laughs> um, and and you know, there's so many. Most people have seen people like horror have seen It Follows and uh, Hereditary and all of that stuff. Um, the Autopsy of Jane Doe, The Black Coat's Daughter, which is also, I think, on Netflix. I love that. Uh, and there's an, a film that just came out that I don't think anybody has seen <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's on demand right now you know, to, uh, to pay for um, called Sea Fever, sea as in the ocean. Um, and it's an Irish film, and it's a, just a little movie that's... Uh, um, it's got a giant creature in it, you guys. You'll enjoy that. But it's mostly about um, uh, it's mostly about infection at sea um, and the choices that people have to make. It's got a real alien vibe. It's got a you know, um, it's terrific. So I recommend that one highly. Excellent. Anything else you've seen recently, Ben or Warwick, that you would recommend to folks? Who enjoy these yeah, things? Yeah, a ton of stuff, but I've gone completely blank now that now that you're asking, and That's I'll remember it all, all later today. <laughs> um, Scott, just saying. Uh, sorry, Chris, just saying. A um, Irish film. There's one called I think it's just called The Hole. Have you yeah. seen that? Yeah, that's the one with the, uh, the backyard that has the hole in it. Yeah, yeah, the woman and her little boy in the house. That's quite cool. Yeah, I'd be um, I'd be remiss also if I didn't mention that my friend Jasmine Hyde starred in a uh, a movie last year um, that I believe in the UK and elsewhere it was called The Unseen, but because it was um, uh, it, there was another movie of that title released in the US around the time it's called something like Amorosis. Um, in the U.S. and amorosis, I think, is sort of like hysterical blindness, something like that. But basically, it's a it's a fantastic story about a couple who've lost their child, and the mother goes blind, um, and then it becomes a real sort of creepy supernatural suspense thriller. Uh, and Jasmine plays the lead character, and she's wonderful. So, excellent recommendations. Taking notes. <laughs> uh anything new for you Warwick that you enjoyed and would recommend or um well, uh the autopsy of Jane Doe's pretty recent and that's yeah that was a great one but um uh I'd sort of try and keep up but there's always old films that sort of you find you watch for the first time you sort of are new to me and um one that yeah as I've seen it a few years ago now but a real one I love is is an, uh, the old dark house, which is a 1930s. That was a yeah. James Whale, which is just ace. It sort of feels a bit like the the first ever, you know, unfortunate group gets stranded in a creepy old house, and then there's sort of all sorts of uh, nuts goings on. There's a sort of a maniac, actually, a whole collection of maniacs living in the house and all that sort of stuff. But that's great. I mean, and it's got a lot of humour in it as well. It's it's. It, you know, there's, there's there's quite a lot going on, but I, I love that and recommend it regularly. Have you watched, not a movie or a film, but, uh, well, there is one and now there is the series, What We Do in the Shadows? Oh, yeah. Yeah, funny. Um, well, just drawing this guy, I mean, he's not, it's, um, I think you're drawing vampires. I was quite keen to draw one of um, Ben's, um, you know, uh, the World War One uniform vampires but um it was it is technically still uh well Purgis night or whichever last night up till this evening and so so i hopped back to mr higgins to the to the valpurgis night party so but these guys are all you know they're all tarted up and pumped up and, <laughs> and uh after going through these reminds me of the guys from what we do in the shadows because that's a brilliant film and i really enjoy the series as well yes yeah, whenever I look at Mr. Higgins or Our Encounters with Evil, it I don't know why, but it I always think of what we do in the shadows. And I mean that in a complimentary way. 
Oh, it's a great movie. <laughs> I love the movie. I have not actually watched the series yet. I need to start that. And that's on Netflix, if anybody is wondering. Oh, it's... So, I have an interesting question from the chat, which I would like to ask you all. Um, they would like to know, what don't you like about your favorite character in the Mignolaverse or Outerverse? So, what are some things that... What are some flaws about your favorite character in the Mignolaverse, Outerverse? And that may take some thought. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I guess I'll... About my favorite... I mean, my favorite character in the Outerverse uh, right now is probably Sophia, so Lady Baltimore. So I'm not going to... I don't have anything negative <laughs> to say about her. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I should say with Baltimore... Um, I always because he's such a doomed character. I mean, that is his his whole story is about him uh, essentially being sort of chosen by fate to get screwed over as bad as any person could ever be screwed over. And um, so I always look for opportunities to add any trace of levity into his uh, his story. And it was difficult to find those opportunities. So I guess that would be my the absence of humor, <laughs> as, while understandable, would be my complaint. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, it was it was about the appropriateness. Um, you know, in the Hellboy, you know, in the Mignolaverse, it's clearly Hellboy. Um, I don't know. It's tough to come up with some. I think having the question be pick your favorite character and then say what you don't like about them. They're your favorite <laughs> yeah. character for a reason. Double edged. You know? <laughs> like aside from Hellboy, it's probably Liz, and my complaint about Liz is that she didn't get enough screen time. Agreed, one hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe for the artists, is there um, anything that I'm sure you have several favorites uh, in terms of the characters, but is there something about those favorites that is maybe a challenge to draw? Baltimore's belts get a little bit. <laughs> it's a little bit boring after a while. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, was going to say to start with, I was excited by those belts, but but after the second or third book, I, it wears off. <laughs> you never told yeah. me. I would have had him lose some. <laughs> <laughs> I always I would have had them. Them. Just... them in in battle, and then they'd be gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I um I changed them for every story. Every time he did something new. He changed his belts a little <laughs> bit. But I'd, I'd say something similar with the with the when you you know when it comes to design these these characters, you kind of have a, a you got to I try and bear in mind that you're going to redraw them so many times, and so there's a few times where you sort of tr I strip myself up and and just make someone much more complicated. And actually, Baltimore's belt is exactly that sort of thing. It's, it looks really cool, and I'm really keen. You know, to 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 draw it myself. You know, but you've got to keep addressing it every time. You know, every panel. Yeah. So the, the the guys in um, the, the professor and uh, Mr. Knox and Mary Van Sloan in in our books are they tend to carry hefty backpacks and all sorts of equipment and then dump it at the first possible moment. So you know they've got it and and then they lose it. So it's uh, keeping down to the sort of the regular sort of minimum outfits. Uh, you know, I have to say, Ben, I'm surprised now that it didn't, you know, when, when you have an actress in a TV series and she's pregnant, but the character's not pregnant, they always find ways to cover up the, her belly, you know, and, like yeah. she's standing behind a potted plant or something. I'm surprised <laughs> start, you know, standing behind potted plants and carrying packages, you know. Um, but uh, I, I, I also want to say, by the way, just to clarify, um, because I know that, uh, you know, there's a there's a difference and some people get confused between movie Hellboy and comics Hellboy. I should say between movie Hellboy and real Hellboy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so when I say not enough screen time for Liz, I'm talking about the comics, not about the films. Fair enough. Yes. And, and a lot of people do know Hellboy uh, primarily from the movies. So some, some folks that is all that they have seen, but Please do read the comics if you haven't. They are they'll add so much more to what you see in those movies. 
Uh, Chris, an interesting question also from Chad. Um, will you be doing any more Outerverse prose works? Um, maybe a serialized short in the back of the comics. I don't know, you know, we can't necessarily talk about everything that hasn't been announced yet, but. Right. Um, uh, here's what I will say. Um, there is no specific plan for new Outerverse prose works, but it's ironic that you should ask because literally yesterday uh, I was thinking, oh, you know, this would be a in the time period that Lady Baltimore and the other new Outerverse uh, stories will cover. Um, I think that'd be really cool. All right. Well, there you have but it. But all it may be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of all we can do uh, for things that are not maybe yet announced or scheduled. Um, stay tuned. We'll announce more when we can. Well, I don't want to keep everybody for too long. Um, however, we can keep going for a bit more if you are all okay with it. Um, I know the sure. artists are still finishing up their their works here, and I'm eager to see those in their final form. And I'm, I'm happy to give them both my address so you guys can just mail me those. That would be great. <laughs> uh, have you, we talked about this a bit uh, earlier, but Mike himself, Mike Mignola, has been doing all of this sketching during quarantine and auctioning off a lot of those sketches for charity. Um, so anybody at home, if you haven't seen those yet, check out Mike's social media. Um, he's been auctioning things on eBay for charity and... I think Ben, were you you were inking on one of his sketches? Is that right? Yeah, I oh. I'll make you shift gears, mm -hmm. but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Oh yeah, look at that. So yeah, Mike has been doing all of these fun sketches of all sorts of characters, lots of giant robots. Is that showing up? Yes. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. can see it. Great. Yeah, I love that. Um. So we will, yeah, we'll drop some links in the chat and check out Mike's social media to see what is happening with all these sketches. Uh, many of them are being auctioned for charity. So you could take one of these home or have one of these shipped to your home. And uh, at the at the end of this today, um, we can follow up later. But if you both wouldn't mind posting your final art to your social media, uh, people love to see the final final product uh, in more detail than we can perhaps get on the stream here. Although both of your cameras are actually looking very clear and crisp to me. So nicely done. Okay. Um, to go back to some of our questions for all, uh, do you have a preference drawing or writing short stories versus longer miniseries or full graphic novels? And uh, why don't we start with Warwick this time? Um, uh, not necessarily, not really, no, the, the, the thing I like about short stories is that you can sort of do more, more of them, so you can do a, you could do a, a city one, and then a few pages later you're in the, you know, Iceland, Icelandic sort of tundra, and then you go to a desert, and you can hop around, and you can do that with a, with a, a long story with a constant changing bits and pieces, but, um, I quite like that about short stories that uh, you you know you could do quite a few different environments and I tried to do a bit of that with um with our encounters with evil they're sort of three different stories and you know sort of set in it's not totally different but quite like different environments but then um with the long stories as well it's quite nice because you do do move from one place to the other and to change pace and things like that a bit more subtly so there's there's the benefits of, in both of them um and I don't know if I necessarily have a preference. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend that people uh, read Mr. Higgins before Our Encounters with Evil, or can they pick up Our, Our Encounters with Evil just on its own? Uh, I would recommend Mr. Higgins first um, because uh, it's got more of uh, Mike's hand in it than, than um, Our Encounters with Evil. But in actual fact... All four of the stories, there's three in, in our encounters, and then there's Mr. Higgins. They, they're not necessarily, one doesn't follow the other. They could all be in any order. You could swap them all around. So, mm -hmm. so um, there's uh, the inclusion of uh, 
Mary Van Sloan in the in our encounters with evil, but she's not in each of the stories. She sort of pops up uh, in and disappears in one, and then she's a one for, along for the ride in uh, in the second one. Mm-hmm. So um, so yeah, in terms of timelines, there isn't uh, an issue with it. You can just uh, pick up whichever one you prefer, or you can get your hands on. <laughs> And how about you, Chris? Any preference uh, within the Mignola verse, outer verse, um, short stories or longer novels? Um, you know, I, I guess what I'll say is I naturally tend to think in longer arcs, but I actually have more fun doing the shorter stories. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so I, I tend to think in longer arcs, and I and my my gut is to go there and sort of create the larger story, but doing the shorter things. Uh, whether it be one or two issue stories or even something like the eight page not King Kong story uh, <laughs> with Baltimore, that was a blast because then you have to think about, you know, what can I accomplish in eight pages? Um, and again, I mean, the length of a story really always comes down to, you know, where when you step in and when you step out. So um, that story could have been three issues, but it's about what part of the story are you showing people? And how about you, Ben? Have you, you've worked on so many different Mignoloverse and Outerverse stories. Any preference between the longer or the shorter stories? Uh, I've always had a soft spot for the short stories just because of that thing that they can be, they can be their own little silly thing and you can, you can do, you know, you can kind of go places, you know, you can go, um, strange places with them, um, but yeah, I, it's all good. I, I like all of them. <laughs> Clearly, you have worked on many. <laughs> well, uh, do you, for the artist? Here's another question: um, Do you prefer drawing action uh, versus the more internalized interpersonal conflict or dialogue? Um, we have we have a few questions from chat actually about like which which do you prefer to draw? I I don't think I really have a preference. I think I think I, I like a chance to draw a um, sort of a quiet still image of something that's a bit kind of spooky or creepy or atmospheric. A little bit more. Um, I'm still. I'm not sure if action is really my strong suit, and I'm still sort of trying to work on that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Another one of these, this versus that, if it's maybe a little easier, would be serious horror versus the more light-hearted or comedic horror. Any preference for one or the other? Um. Uh, I can't, no, no, I quite like mixing them up, uh, um, sort of, it's quite a balance and it's, uh, I'm always trying to try and see what, you, you know, uh, um, Encounters with Evil and Mr Higgins, they've got some, I mean, Mike's just got such a fantastic way with humour with the stories, um, you know, even something that's not, you know, they're not jokes, but just the reactions and things like that and, um, reading, um, reading Mr. Higgins' script just in places just made me laugh out loud. So I was trying to bring some of that into our Encounters with Evil as well, have some of those lighter moments. But um, it, I kind of didn't want to make it too much fun. So there's some pretty grisly stuff in there as well, which I was quite enjoying drawing. This really sort of messy, quite uh, gruesome. And, and so some of that's a, it, it's quite nice to try and get a ballot because... Um, uh, it, 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 I quite like, well, yeah, to find a balance in certain terms of like Ben mentioned when horror films and stuff where they just sort of really sort of stay dark all the way through and um, to have a bit of a change of pace. You sometimes can get much more effective kind of things going on, which is talking about the old dark house was was like that because you've got some jokes and some lighter bits and then sort of the horror stuff going on as well. And, and by having one, you can sort of, you know, uh, make the other a bit more uh, striking, as it were, sort of um, interesting. Absolutely. And contrast. 
Well, we have another uh, fun question, I think, anyway. Uh, if the main characters in some of your stories, let's say Baltimore or, I mean, even Witchfinder, I think, uh, whatever comes to mind, um, if they were in quarantine like we are now, how do you think they would pass the time? And perhaps we can start with Chris. <laughs> um Baltimore would not stay in quarantine. Let's be clear. I mean, he has a mission. He has a mission, and uh, and he would not stay in quarantine. Um, uh, however, if we're looking at uh, at Lady Baltimore, um, I think that Sophia, uh, her mission when we meet her now is somewhat different, uh, and. I think that Sophia would be more than happy to curl up by the fire with her girlfriend. So, um, uh, very different characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Baltimore just wanted to die. So <laughs> he was just, he was, you know, he was just pursuing his own demise. So he's not going to sit around, you know, uh, you know, playing Parcheesi or something, you know? Right. This is a glorious opportunity. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Ben? You've worked on so many different characters. They all probably have a different approach to this. Yeah, I think uh, Edward Gray would be pretty happy just sitting at home reading. <laughs> Absolutely. And Warwick, you have your own cast of characters over there. Yeah, well, I, I, um, and as you, you sort of find out at the end of Encounters with Evil, they kind of they all live in the same big old house, and so they, you know. I think they'd be quite happy. Well, I think the professor and Mr. Knox, they'd be finding plenty of things to do. I think uh, uh, Mary Van Sloan would be quite itching to get back out there again. But, um, but yeah, no, they sort of, you know, whether it's Knox in his workshop or um, the professor in his sort of dusty academic bits and pieces, there'd be a lot of uh, in, in, sort of uh, going through old books and, and trying to work out where the next vampires are likely to be found and stuff like that. So. We had kind of a similar discussion earlier this week on a stream that was a little more focused on Hellboy and the BPRD and what would the BPRD members be doing during quarantine. Um, obviously, Hellboy and Liz would probably pass the time with, I like to think, you know, drinking, hanging out, maybe playing some poker or something, maybe setting things on fire, who knows. But I think Kate Corrigan would be pretty... <laughs> restless and need to get back out there. <laughs> uh, Jenny, the assistant editor on all of these, um, suggested that uh, Broom might also be busy sewing masks. Seems like a broom thing to do. <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> Keeping his hands busy. Well, again, I don't want to delay too long. We are over the time I expected, but um, I think it's all been very productive and the art is coming together beautifully. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us and for Ben and Warwick for sketching today and kind of demonstrating how you work, showing us some vampires. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally, near the end of these things, I would ask what you have coming up, but of course, everything is a bit in flux right now due to the pandemic. Um, and so we're working on rescheduling things there. Again, there have been a lot of questions in chat today about Lady Baltimore in particular. Um, that will be when we can announce a new release date. We'll absolutely do so. So stay tuned for that. Um, everything is just kind of paused right now. Things are not canceled. So we will have new release dates as soon as we can announce those. So look for that. Um, we're at Dark Horse Comics across all social media and, of course, on our website. Um, so for all of you who are here with us today, maybe starting with Chris, could you tell people where they can find you on social media or websites? Um, you can find me and all my books and comics at ChristopherGolden.com. Uh, and I'm on Twitter uh, at Christoph. They didn't have room for the ER at Christoph Golden. And uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm around. I don't post on Instagram much, but uh, I'm very easy to get in touch with. There you have it. Uh, how about you, Ben? Yeah, I've um, uh, got bensteenbeck.com. I think I'm just Ben Steenbeck on Facebook and Twitter and Mr. Steenbeck to you on Instagram. <laughs> Excellent. And how about you, Warwick? Are you on social media? 
Yeah, uh, yes. Um, I'm on Twitter as uh, Warwick JC. I'm on Instagram as Wocko, W O C C O, because um, I didn't really realize what I was signing up for when I actually got <laughs> onto Instagram. But it's the busiest place. To... It's where I put stuff out. And um, Patreon as well as uh, Patreon forward slash also. But, um, oh. and, uh, and Facebook. But, um, so, yeah sort of all over but i've got a terrible website so don't worry about that <laughs> <laughs> fair enough uh we have just drawn a winner in our giveaway so look for that in the chat the winner is weird tinker all one word so uh to claim your prize which is a copy of the baltimore omnibus volume one and a copy of mr higgins comes home here's vol volume one right here a gorgeous hardcover both gorgeous hardcovers, actually. Um, all you need to do is type claim, use exclamation point claim, or just send us a whisper, which is a private message here on Twitch, and we will get in touch with you about shipping. Um, and I think that is all. It's the other questions we've had in chat, again, have a lot of been, a lot of them have been about other upcoming possible series and things like that, uh, such as any further additions to the Our Encounters with Evil universe. Um, we will announce things as soon as we can. But again, thanks for your patience because everything is somewhat in flux right now with the pandemic and various closures, but we're starting to get back on track. So we'll absolutely be announcing new things and updated release dates on our website and across all of those social media channels we just went through. Um, and I am looking at this artwork that you two are finishing up right now. Do you, I mean, don't let me stop you. Please continue to finish up what you're working on. But if you wouldn't mind sharing the finished products on your social media later today or whatever time you are in, we're in very disparate time zones. I don't know if everybody realizes that. Um, oh, and of yeah. course, is New Zealand, Warwick in England, and Chris and I on opposite coasts of the United States. So thank you so much, everyone, for making the time, early or late though it may be, um, to join us for this stream today. Thank you, Kara. No, it's great. It's great. <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And I will release you all into the wild once again. Um, thank you again and have a good afternoon, <laughs> my time, uh, whatever time it is for you, if you are watching everyone. So thank you and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>